Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. This is a video, third video, okay, video number three, third video for the topic um, general defenses in thoughts. Let me maximize the slide. Okay. In the first two parts, okay, we covered um, the defense of volunteer non fit injury. Okay, we covered the, the meaning, okay, the, the cases. And we discussed specifically the two circumstances in which volunteer and fit injury in sports as well as in rescue cases. Now we are going to, to discuss the second general defense in thoughts, which is the defense of illegality. Actually, the uh, illegality is also relevant for contract law, but from the perspective of vitiating factor, so different application, okay, different rule altogether. Right now, we focus on thoughts. So, for the defense of illegality, the what we are going to discuss under, um, I mean, for this particular um, subtopic is that first, what? Okay, what is illegality? What is the defense? And then how it can be applied? And then some of the relevant cases, case law, basically. Okay, defense of illegality. Uh, so, what's the principle governing this defense here? The, pre the principle is that no court okay, ought to enforce an illegal contract or allow itself to be made uh, the instrument of enforcing obligations alleged to arise out of an illegal transaction. So actually, uh, the same principle uh, is applicable to contract law. So applicable to parts law as well. And the same legal maxim as well, okay, applicable to both because both are civil action, okay, civil in nature. So the maxim is that, uh, the maxim uh, is known as Extrapi causa non orito actio. This is uh, Latin, okay, Latin terms. Now, what's the meaning here? The meaning is that from a dishonorable cause, an action does not arise. So, meaning that here you cannot file a claim, you cannot make an action based on dishonorable cause, based on illegal cause. So, basically, when we talk about defense of illegality, it revolves around serving public interest. So we are not giving the venue for the defendant to be absolved from liability because of by pleading the defense of illegality here. Okay, and how it is being applied actually, how it is uh, being made relevant to that scenario, okay, to this specific scenario. It is applied, it is relevant when the illegality is duly brought to the notice of the court and the person, due the plaintiff himself, is himself implicated in the illegality. Uh, this is taken from the, the case of Scott and Brown. So basically, in order to, uh, I mean, to make the defense relevant here, in, in order to make it uh, uh, applicable, the defend, def defendant must prove, uh, must establish, must convince the court that the, plaintiff, the plaintiff's conduct is so clearly repre repre reprehensible, in the year, blame worthy, deserving blame, as to justify its condemnation by the court. And defendant also must prove to the court that the conduct is so much part of a claim against the defendant as to justify refusal of remedy to plaintiff. So illegality is available to the defendant and this is how he proved to the court. It is how he established it by, by uh, convincing the court, okay, proving that actually plaintiff is also part of the illegal conduct or illegal transaction, okay, illegal act here. Let's have a look. I mean, this is the two possibilities, the two uh, um, scenario, okay, that might happen, okay, which involve illegality as a defense. Uh, the first one, this is hypothetical, okay. The first one, two burglars, robbers, A and B, they agreed to open a safe by means of explosive, and during, the, uh, I mean, while they were doing this act, the criminal act here, okay, A negligently, um handle, sorry, the typo, handle the explosive charge and eject B. I mean, um, both are burglars here. So now can B, because now B is being injured, can B take action for negligence against A because negligence acts by A and they were doing the, uh, the act together, okay? And another uh, possible situation, hypothetical one, okay? If A and B are proceeding to premises on, the, on their way, which they, have, they intend burglariously to enter, they are about to enter, and before they enter them, okay, B picks, picks A's pocket, pick pocket, okay, and steals A's watch. I mean, B is the one who 
and did the, the, the act of pickpocketing and stealing the watch. Now, can A sue B in Cox? Both involve criminal action here. I mean, criminal, criminal act. First one, they, they were doing the act. Okay? And second one, they are about to do it. Okay? They are on their way to do the act. Okay? And actually, these uh, two possible situations was um, quoted, okay, was uh, the one which was uh, this part of the statement, okay, given by Lord Asquith in the case of National Coal Board and England, 1954. So, uh, the defense of illegality was applied in cases involving joint participants in crime. So, the famous case, the landmark case is Ashton and Turner. I think there are not many cases in which um, the party pleaded illegality, I mean the defendant pleaded illegality, okay. Um, here, plaintiff and defendant committed burglary, burglar, okay, they were robber, okay, burglar, and escaped from the scene in a getaway car. So they were they were in the process of escape, okay, and they were met by accident and it injured plaintiff. Now, uh, plaintiff claimed negligence, uh, claim for negligence against defendant, but the court disallowed the claim. The court rejected the claim. Guess why? Um, the, the defense of illegality was applicable here. I mean, they were involved in illegal conduct, illegal act. So both of them were parties to it. So we, we just apply the rule. Ex so, because uh, non orito actual from this honorable cause from the robbery. So action does not arise. You cannot make a claim because why well, you were involved in a robbery. And this is another case. Pits and Hans, also a landmark case. You will find this case in uh, any of the textbooks uh, when we discuss about the defense of illegality. Reported in 1990, so it's not that old case. 1990s, okay, 1990. After an, after an evening's drinking, plaintiff and defendant set off home on motorcycle. They were riding motorcycle together, motorbike. Which defendant okay, was to plaintiff knowledge? Okay, defendant here was the one who uh, rode uh, the bike. Okay? So defendant neither license nor insured to ride. I mean, no license, no insurance. Okay, when they were riding the bike. And what more? Okay, this is drunk and right, drunk and drive. So defendant's alcohol level was twice that was permitted. So I mean, uh, it contravened the law, obviously. So encouraged by the plaintiff, plaintiff is the one who said, okay. Uh, I mean, faster, go faster. So defendant wrote in a reckless and hazardous manner in order to frighten members of the public. And uh, we can um, guess what happened. So accident happened, accident occurred. So plaintiff got injured. Remember, okay, plaintiff was riding with the defendant and he knew about it. Okay, he knew about the risk and he was the one who encouraged plaintiff to uh, ride in such a reckless and hazardous manner. So in the court of appeal, um, it was held that plaintiff action failed okay, on the ground of public policy because he was engaged in illegality and uh, the court doesn't want to really make a standard of care okay, when, whenever it involves criminal activity. So here there are three, um, uh, I mean three criminal elements here, all right, no, no, no license, no insurance and reckless and hazardous manner of uh, riding the bike here. Okay, for local cases, we also have local cases on illegality. Okay, the first case is Chua Kim Swan and Government of Malaysia reported in 1994. Plaintiff was the, the administrator of the estate of the deceased. And who was the deceased? The deceased was a taxi driver and he was driving without legal license, no license. So he met with an accident and he was killed. So the court didn't allow the loss to be claimed. The losses were not claimable because why? It will be against public policy. So, um, I mean, driving the car, okay, with, I mean, driving the taxi without a legal license, so it affects the whole, I mean, the safety of public at large. So, this is something which is against public policy if the claim uh, would be allowed by the court. So, the court didn't allow uh, the claim for the losses. And we have another case, T. Kian Hock and Kewangan Bersatu Berhad to to I think it involves certain higher purchase of spray pump. Okay, that's the picture. So the real owner was defendant. Okay, he he rented it out to the plaintiff. So plaintiff was the owner lah, temporary owner. Okay, defendant repossessed a wrong, uh, and in the course of repossessing, okay, defendant repossessed a wrong spray pump. That's why now plaintiff uh, was suing him for 
conversion. Okay, conversion is uh, intentional uh, uh, thoughts action. Lah. Okay, conversion. In I mean, criminal term will be F. So now plaintiff sued the front end for conversion, but claim for conversion was not successful. The court didn't allow the claim for, uh, for I mean, on the part of the plaintiff. Why? Because plaintiff conduct, okay, what's the conduct here? Plaintiff was the one who did not return the defendant's equipment, that is a spray pump, the spray pump has formed integral part of the conversion by defendant. Conversion happened okay, because the plaintiff started it. Okay, you hide it, okay? you didn't return the pump, that's why defendant tried to repossess. And in the course of doing so, defendant repossessed a wrong spray pump. Okay, so plaintiff actually contributed to this conversion, the so-called conversion. So it was again public conscience to allow the claim by the plaintiff. Conversion was perpetrated by the plaintiff himself. He was the one who started the act. Okay? Had the spray pump not been hidden and available for repossession, no problem. There will be no conversion. Okay? The defendant will have repossessed it without any hassle, okay? without the need to, uh, to repossess the wrong one okay? instead of repossessing the correct one, okay? which the plaintiff need to return to the defendant. Okay, we are done with illegality. That's the second defense here okay, under general defenses for thoughts. Now we move to the third one, okay, inevitable accident. Accident which cannot be avoided. And this is the definition from case law defined by Sir Frederick Pollock. Okay, he defined inevitable accidents to mean accident which is not avoidable okay, by any such precautions as a reasonable man doing such an act then and there could be expected to take. In that here, it's not possible to really uh, prevent okay, it from, uh, to prevent the accident from happening okay, or by whatever uh, uh, reasonable precaution. Okay. And then uh, the, the relevant um, quotation uh, or explanation okay, was done in the case of Farden and Hackett Rivington. People must get against reasonable probabilities, not fantastic possibilities. The moment it happened because of fantastic possibilities, then this is something which is inevitable. It cannot be got, okay? There will be no uh, reasonable precaution. So, and uh, this is taken from um, Sir James Colville in the case of the Mar Marpicia, okay? A very old case, 1872. So, and, uh, and, an inevitable accident in point of law. Okay, what's the meaning of the, of the word of the word in law as in talks law? That which the party charged with the with the offense could not possibly prevent okay, by the exercise of ordinary care, caution, and maritime skill. Even though uh, they have exercised this care, caution, and skill, still it happened. It cannot be prevented. It cannot be avoided. So the defense will be made available. Let's have a look at the case, um, local case. Okay? Cik Jah binti Muhammad Arif and C.C. Scott uh, reported in 1952. Plaintiff was a passenger in the defendant's car okay, which crashed into a stationary car causing injuries to the passenger. So plaintiff is the, was the passenger. So plaintiff gave evidence uh, about previous, uh, I mean defendant, sorry, defendant, the one who caused the accident okay, because he crashed into the stationary car. So defendant uh, gave evidence about previous reparation and maintenance activities. It was properly repaired, properly maintained, keep properly serviced, and brakes were repaired and tested and functioned well. So the court held that, um, the finding by the court, there was a defect in the brake. Okay, the, the, the brake defects were latent, hidden, uh, concealed, latent defects. And as the defendant has employed skill labor, no negligence can be attributed. So meaning here yeah, we cannot really uh, put the blame on the defendants for big negligence. So this defense is inevitable. So the defense of inevitable was successfully accepted by the court. Was made applicable in this case. Okay, because of all the of all the factors here, okay, there was uh, records of reparation properly maintained, properly repaired, brakes were repaired properly, tested well, but don't function well. And but there was some latent defects which actually caused the accident, one of the reasons for causing the accident. That's why even if he uh, applied the brake, he still it crashed into the stationary car. But compared with this case, the defense of inevitable accident could not apply in the, in the following cases. We have two cases. Okay? The first one is Tanga Chima and another and Flower, uh, reported in 1968. What happened was that 
uh, defendant was driving, okay, but suddenly um, his car windscreen shattered okay, without warning and then completely obscured his view. So he cannot see okay, when he was driving. So the car collided with the deceased cyclist. So uh, there was a cyclist, okay, he was cycling and then uh, he was, uh, I mean, defendant um, crash okay, onto the cyclist and then uh, it caused the death okay, of the cyclist. But the court held that defendant failed to discharge the honors, the burden okay, of, uh, of proof on him to show, to prove to the court that the cause of accident was a, a cause not produced by him and the result of which he could not avoid. He actually alleged, oh, it's not my fault. I don't know why it happened, okay? But it's not my fault. So it's not enough, okay? You really have to prove to the court. So the defense failed. I mean, the, the defense of inevitable accident was not properly proved. And this is taken from actual judgment here. Okay, the court said he, the judge, he, however, gave no explanation and made no attempt eh, to give any as to the cause of the shattering. Because in his defense, he said, suddenly my car's windscreen shattered. But what's the cause? He doesn't know what's the cause. So, I mean, it's hard to really um, uh, convince the court that uh, we should allow you to plead the defense of inevitable accident. The accident actually was uh, avoidable. Okay, I mean, if you drive properly, maybe you really drove um, at a high speed. Okay, that's why the windscreen shattered. So it was stated here, he left um, the court in the dark uh, to guess whether the windscreen which might have already been defective, maybe your windscreen was defective. So this is something which is avoidable if you maintain your car properly. Okay, uh, was shattered by excessive vibration of the car due to the speed in which it was traveling. Okay? or whether the body of the cyclist had been thrown onto the bonnet of the car and smashed the windscreen, or whether it had been hit by other flying objects. So what's the real reason? Nothing. Okay? No evidence was produced in the court. So I believe it is a, it's a mere um, allegation okay, on the part of the defendant. That's why the court didn't accept the defense of inevitable accident as raised by the defendant. It was, must be properly proved and established. Then only the court will, um, I mean, will accept okay, the defense. Okay, another case, Zainun Bentil Abdul Ghani and Chong Aseng. Um, here, another case in which it shows that the defense of inevitable accident fail um, because uh, uh, defendant's car knocked down a cyclist. Okay, cyclist is the plaintiff, lah, okay, the claimant. After the tire suddenly burst. Okay, meaning here when uh, she was driving, the tire sudden, suddenly burst. So the court... Uh, sorry, he, okay. The court found defendant negligent in using worn out equipment that is almost about, about tire, okay. So the, to displace the presumption, okay, defendant must go further and prove, uh, must establish all the, produce all the evidences that the burst tire itself was due to specific cause that does not connote or suggest negligence on their part. Okay. And the court state, um, the court clearly expressly stated that um, defendant will escape liability if he succeeds in proving that the accident occurred despite the exercise of reasonable care on his part. Okay? So what he, he, has, uh, he, he must do okay, in order to plead uh, or to raise the defense successfully, he must either show what was the cause of the accident, prove it to the court, okay? and uh, the result was uh, inevitable, convince the court that it happened uh, unavoidable. Okay? I cannot avoid the accident from happening and show all the possible causes which produce the effect. Tell the court, okay, prove it to the court. What is the real cause of the accident? Or is it something which is avoidable? Or is it something which is unavoidable? So both tire, mean that here it is something which is avoidable. If you change your tire, so, I mean, it will function uh, properly. Okay, it won't cause the accident. So accident is avoidable rather than inevitable. Okay, last case for... Um, part one uh, of general defenses, Sarawak Shell Berhad and the owners of or other persons interested is a long name, okay? in the ship or vessel, the red gold and another action 2011. So it involves a collision between, okay, it's not ship and ship, between ship and offshore oil platform, like in the picture, okay, platform and the ship. So now the, the issue is relevant for our topic here, the discussion here, whether or not okay, uh, burden, burden of proof on the defendant to prove inevitable accident. And as far as the facts was concerned, okay, the owners uh, of the ship had not established that the accident would have occurred even without their negligence. 
which is why the, 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 the real cause of, uh, of the accident was the defect. Okay? The defect could have been rectified or avoided by proper securing of the said power card and the system of routine visual checking. So the defects in the system, uh, basically here. So the court held that the defense uh, of inevitable accident fail because uh, defendant cannot really prove it okay, that they actually have taken whatever uh, reasonable action here okay, and no reasonable explanation was given. Uh, okay, that's why the collision happened. So this is something which is uh, avoidable, not really inevitable. Okay, we are done. All right, so we are done with all the three. Uh, part one, it covers three general defenses. Okay, we started with volunteer and fit injury and then uh, followed by illegality. And the last one was uh, inevitable accident that we have just now discussed. So I'm so sure. Okay, that's all for part one of the of the lecture general defenses. Okay, we are going to continue with uh, part two general defenses. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh.